I am. I am immensely surprised at how much fun I'm having making these videos. Yes, they are therapeutic. But also I'm learning. And if there's one thing I like doing, it's learning. As I'm getting older, learning is more difficult, not because I don't want to. Many old people stop learning because they don't want to. They feel like they know enough already. As an elder, I find it immensely interesting to continue learning. It's slower. The process has to the process has to be slower, but the process is everything. Now that I understand how important it is to make mistakes, learning is such a different process, not full of fear of making mistakes, but full of joy of making mistakes because each mistake helps me learn more. As I've spoken of before, the process of teaching that the Westerners, I would say maybe even the entire world, has given to the children, to all beings, in the process of learning is the fear of mistakes. And that is exactly the opposite way that one should approach mistakes. So I've made so many mistakes with these videos, but each mistake, because I own to it and I look at it and I am joyful that I made that mistake because that showed me something. So, I wish you as many mistakes as possible. Please make mistakes. Please feel free to make mistakes. Mistakes are a blessing. I'm also one of those people who watch everything. As I listen, I watch everything. I watch how people do everything because I will learn something from anybody and everybody who does something. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people tend to only watch those they think are masters of the thing. But to watch somebody carefully who is not a master of the thing, who is maybe even clumsy with a thing, one learns so much about the clumsiness of a thing. That clumsiness is instructive. So to learn is to open oneself to everything, not just, just the so-called masters, the pompous hubris, blowhards, but the innocents, the people who, if you ask them, they would say, I really don't know what I'm doing. And in that not knowing what they're doing, in the difficulty they are having, there is instruction to be had. There is learning to be had. There is joy in the process of getting better. And I am getting better at videotaping myself. So today, as you see, my camera angle is different. I was feeling it. 
I am a two-man being, not a human being. Thus, I have two parts, not one. That is the evolutionary path. Multiplicity, the pureness ideal that was held by the slaveholders by Hitler, by Romans, by all those beings who enslaved others and spoke so strongly of purity. That purity is the superiority. To them I say, you are liars, erroneous. You have misled the world. You have killed the people. You have destroyed things. I am a Tuman being. It brings up again my desire to bring your attention to my friend Bob Laff, with whom I spent maybe a week in our relationship, our friendship, our huge Cannot think of how to express it. Bob Laugh's method of being in the world was to paint one side of his body black and the other side of his body white. And he spoke of each side as, a, as one side or the other. This is very much in the realm of the Tao he looked like the Tao when he was in stillness. That was a short love for him. After I saw him off, or I left, and he saw me off at the train station, I never saw him again but he left such an imprint in my life, in my work, in my ideas. Tuman being is one. He left such an imprint in my life and work that he is forever in my thoughts. I thought I should speak of him a bit more after talking about him yesterday. Sometimes we will speak of always, ever, never, nothing, all. We fail to realize that these words are, have a tacit connection to infinity. Never means never. That means in the entire time of whatever, it will not occur again, whatever, never. To use words like that require an extreme, extreme ability to discern infinity. And most people do not know how to discern infinity. Their mistake immediately is to speak of God. Are they speaking of an infinite presence or are they speaking of a very large being who is just very powerful? I don't know, but they use this word 
And this word implies infinity. Infinity sits at the base of this word. And one of the most important lessons that I have learned is to be very, very careful with infinite words. Words that imply infinity are very, very difficult to handle. Since I am a finite being, I will die. So, I always talk about my students or non-students. And that speaks, or it does not speak of the fact that I do have a student. I can't speak of that I never have a student, or I didn't have a student, or I never had students. So I have to be careful when I speak about something like that. I cannot speak about never, because I have a student. She couldn't be a better student, either. And I speak of the sweetie, who, as I have been speaking, is not feeling well. So that relationship between teacher and student is a very, very tricky one. Because if one wants to speak of oneself as a master, as a teacher, one then has to speak of oneself as a student. And most teachers, most with posters up hanging around Bali, for instance, are not like that. They stand in front of a group of people and act like masters. They do not act like students, thus they are no masters. To have a student means that one needs to learn from that being what they need. Not to force upon them what I, as a pompous master would say, you need to learn this, you need to learn that. You need to learn about this. You need to learn about that. The best way to teach is to model. And then to be extremely open to whatever a student requires from experiencing that modeling. No, there have not been any other students save her. Is that bad? Is that good? According to most in the world, that is not good. Those teachers who have many students are considered to be touted, highly appraised for their mastery because all the students speak of them as masters because they as masters have told them that they are masters and now they have students who tell everybody that they're masters and then they go around teaching that whatever it is that that master taught and then other people think oh they learned from that master then i will learn from that master through them thus on these posters around bali you will have a lot of the teachers teaching, yoga, training, claim to be, have studied their yoga training from some master, some name that one would recognize, Bubu Baba, Master Kandi Tupu, Master Bimbi Papi. It's a scam.
when Socrates was murdered, he would sit in the main square and just talk with people. He was a great modeler. We have no writings of his. The only writings we have of his, the only writings about his method and his modeling is from Plato, and Plato took it from a slightly different angle. He was murdered because he modeled. Modeling is the most powerful way of teaching. So I've had one student and I can say that that is a success because I have not hung posters telling anybody I teach anything. I do not sit in a social group and claim in that social group to teach anything. I do not, in the dialogue with another who is pontificating about how much they're able to do after their five years of study, I do not tell them, well, I've studied for 70 years after your five years. What is the difference between these two things? Your five years, and look at you talking up a storm about how much you uh, have, are going to teach somebody and a bunch of people voice activation, musical, anything. You're not teaching anybody anything. I don't claim to be a teacher. I never will. But I model my expression. I am fully embodied in my expression. I am fully heart activated in my expression. I am my expression, my being duty. Those who would study that, would learn from me, would be those who are capable even of seeing this, and that is very few. I doubt very much that any of you see. I really love getting fiery. It is my kindness that causes me in social environments where somebody starts talking too much, not to say, could you please stop talking so much? Could we have some silence? I think now as I've come into my elderness, now that I am an elder, I think I'm going to practice doing that with people. One of the experiences I've had in my life that illustrates quite a few things is English class in junior high school. I was taking an English class from a being who's Skin was as brown as my mother's. And 
That was unusual. Most teachers in junior high school at the time when I was in junior high school did not have such beautiful brown skin. Most of them were white. Beige. In uh, times of those, it was perceived that the people who were pale, who were white, were beige, were capable of teaching and had more knowledge to impart than a brown-skinned, black-skinned being. That has changed now. But the method of teaching, as I have spoken of, has not changed. So I didn't like English, or that's incorrect. I really liked English, but I was afraid of making mistakes in English. I also had a Being that I was in the advanced classes and my, they call those special progress classes, classes where you have shown high capability and they, give, they reward you by putting you in a class that does some extra hard study, let us say. Most of my classmates were not my color. They were not brown. So I was the only, or one, or I'm trying to remember this. I may have been the only brown skinned being in my class, but I don't want to say that I know that for sure because my memory is so faulty. Anyway. Coming up in class was what was called an oratory contest. All of the English classes were, had representing them three classmates who presented to the entire school um, a oratory, a poem, a piece of writing, which they recited on stage in the assembly. My self-confidence, my self-confidence being as it was, low, was extremely uninterested in this. And yet it was an assignment. I had to choose a poem and present it to the class and my teacher would then, my beautifully brown skin teacher, would then choose three of us who could then represent us in the assembly and in the entire school. I didn't really take it seriously, but at the same time, I really liked some poems that I, uh, I liked a very particular poem. And I thought, why not just memorize this and try it out for the class? But I didn't expect anything, and should I? I already had, as I said, low self-confidence. So my teacher, when I did it and recited it, my teacher chose me as one of our representatives. I was stunned. Stunned. She then took me under her wing and helped me develop the piece. It was The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes. 
The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor. And the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. See, I still remember it. I didn't understand why she was taking me under her wing, why she helped me. I, I don't, do I know how to recite? Do I know anything about poetry? All my other classmates are so much smarter than I am. What am I being chosen to do this for? And yet, I took it seriously. I took it so seriously that Let us see, we had about five assemblies where we recited these poems, all of us. And about halfway through, I was, I love sports and I was good at them. I was out in the yard and we were um, playing baseball or practicing hitting baseballs. And um, one of the st other students was taking his swings and we had, let us say, 10 of them. I can't remember again, this is a memory gap. They took, uh, each, keep, each person, each of us, would take 10 swings at the ball and hit them out into the yard where people were catching them and playing, you know, catch them and throw them back. So we had a, a thing going. So this fellow had taken 10 swings and then it was my turn. So I stepped up to him and instead of relinquishing the bat and the ball to me, he took another swing at the ball. Completely unexpected. And he hit me square in the head. I didn't go down. In fact, I said, could I have the bat? Now it's my turn. I was taken to the infirmary. I was bandaged. The bruise on my forehead, which is right here, you can still see it's a scar. The bruise on my forehead, in fact, it's possible in my mentation to believe that that could have been the, one of the reasons why I have seizures now. The bruise on my forehead developed into this huge black and blue splotch that covered my entire face, right like this. Blood flowed into my face and was black and blue. It hurt. So, did I say I can't do the oratory contest? I'm injured. No, I didn't. I did it anyway. So I had about two or three performances where I was covered in this black and blue accident. They voted and I won third place. Third place. I was shocked. Now, about 60 years or six, let's say uh, uh, 55 years from that incident, there are so many things about it that I learned from. One of those things is that 
My brown skin teacher behaved in a way that a white skin teacher would not have. She saw the talent in me and decided to step, to take me under her arm and push me. This behavior is an illustration of why many of the brown skinned beings, the beings that were not white, were not I want to use the correct word to describe this. Because white skinned teachers would not have would not pick the brown skinned beings to represent. They could not see the talent. To them, brown-skinned beings are lazy. I experienced this even recently when my father-in-law whispered in my wife's ear that black people were lazy. I'm still pissed off about him doing that. And I'll be pissed off till the end of my life at him for saying that. My mother was not lazy. My grandmother was not lazy. My grandfather was not lazy and all my ancestors were not lazy. They were talented and extremely passionate and powerful beings. For him to have whispered that at a table of dinner while I was present was worth a punch in the face. To win third place at the oratory contest was presaging my extremely talented ability to perform at that time, I could not have any sense of the fact that I had such a gift. I was so, as I've said before, insecure in my gifts. I didn't think of myself as intelligent. I didn't think of myself as a performer. I didn't think of myself as somebody who could represent my class and win third place in the entire school. But my teacher did. It's remarkable because this teacher had faith in me. This teacher who I honor, Mrs. So-and-so, sorry I don't remember your name, was in a sense one of the first people who saw how gifted I was at performing. And her eyes were not clouded over by racism because she welcomed me. And I have completely followed through. I can walk through the streets of Bali faced with animosity from Islamic people, from expatriotic people, from whoever has trouble with me, and I can perform into their face in full volume and full power and dance and silence. No, I don't teach but I model 